new baby in the front. That's wonderful. Um, I want to draw your attention to this passage that was read in your hearing in Luke chapter 5 and bring some uh, fresh insights perhaps for some of you from uh, what Luke has recorded here. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. <coughs> we know a little bit more about the context of, uh, of this miracle. We know, for example, that Jesus had got up very early that morning and had prayed because he was going to make the choice of the disciples, the apostles who would follow him. And we know also that that same night, the uh, four of the apostles were fishermen and they were busy fishing all night. And um, fishermen need to pray and uh, praying people need to eat to holy vocations, honouring God in what you do. And uh, so the next morning Jesus came looking for them and he knew he would find these four uh, by the seashore because they were fishermen. Now when he arrived the news spread um, along the beach that Jesus of Nazareth was there and people came crowding to hear him and uh, he was soon surrounded the uh, men especially the leaders the older men they were a phalanx around him and then there were the uh, young people and the women and uh, soon they they couldn't hear what Jesus was saying now there's some indication in scripture that Jesus was of medium height, he wasn't a tall man. When uh, Zacchaeus wanted to uh, see the Lord Jesus, he went up a tree so that he could look down over the surrounding men to look down at, at the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus can sleep on a pillow, on a boat, indications that he wasn't a a, a tall gangling man like some of us are so um, the people start to complain we can't hear sorry we can't hear speak up now Jesus could have done a miracle couldn't he he could have removed the earwax from all the people listening and dumped it in the sea or he uh, he could have turned the volume up and uh, suddenly this loud, loud voice was heard by everyone. He didn't do miracles like that. In medieval times there were those stories. The patron saint of Wales is St. David Derry Sant. And there's a legend that he once went to Llanthewy Brevi to preach and he was a man of medium height and the people couldn't hear him and the legend says that uh, God caused the earth to rise up in a little hill and he stood on top of the hill and everyone could see and hear him that that didn't happen like unicorns and dragons they don't exist they're, they're myths so what did the Lord Jesus do well he pushed his way through the men and people says oh he's going Jesus is going don't go Jesus stay we want to hear you we're eager that you should teach us and he went to Peter and he said uh, push out your boat a little bit and he got into the boat and Peter pushed it out and then the prow of the boat was on the beach and uh, Jesus sat there and spoke to the people and they lined up along the beach and the water and the pebbles were good sounding board and everyone could hear him and could begin to understand the wonderful 
truths of the kingdom of God that he spoke about. Um, so often people want miracles, don't they? People have always followed Jesus. And Jesus said, it's a sinful, it's a rebellious generation that always wants miracles. They're looking for miracles. You remember the Pharisees saw Lazarus rise from the dead and that just encouraged them in their hatred to put Jesus to death. So a hunger for miracles or a church that boasts we have miracles every Sunday in our church. Miracles of healing and deliverance. It doesn't mean that the Spirit of God is there creating such publicity. And so, um, you know, common sense is the greatest gift after grace. And some evangelical Christians are, are not gifted with that grace as they might be. So there was no sign that was done at this time. And at this time, he didn't summon the disciples to give up everything and follow him. So um, the, he finishes preaching and uh, he notices that the disciples are, are there and they've had a fruitless night of fishing. It's not just that they've got nothing to show for it. They've got dirty, torn nets that have to be washed. They long to go home and go to bed and sleep. But before they can do that, they've got to clean up their nets. It's a picture of a, the activity of futility that so many people in the world experience. Because, you see... Peter wasn't fishing as his hobby. Like some of you like to go fishing. P Peter had a wife to support. He had fished to sell, to get money, to buy food for himself and the family. And it was not then when Jesus saw them working weary that he came to them and said, I will make you fishers of men. That would be the inclination of many in the gospel church in our day. A um, young man thinks um, he might become a minister. And the inclination is to say, oh, don't you know, it's, it's a really difficult calling these days. It's uh, the many disappointments and a lot of frustration and hard graft. And many would think this was the perfect time to call them to become fishers of men when they were weary and cleaning the nets and got nothing to show for it. It would steal Peter for a lifetime of fishing for men, plodding away years of dashed hopes. Ernest Hemingway is a wonderful American writer. <clears throat> And one of his last books was called The Old Man and the Sea. And it tells the story of an old fisherman who leaves in his little boat the Florida to go out into the Gulf in order to catch the biggest marlin that's ever been caught, to break the records. He knows the place where marlins hang out. And so he, 20 hours, he sails out there and then he baits his hook and he throws it in and he gets a huge marlin. And he works for hours, the thread running through his hands, they're bleeding. He brings it in and then it goes out again and he brings it in and he works and finally he gets it. And he ties it to the side of the boat and he turns his boat around to sail home. But the sharks scent the blood of the marlin. 
and they come thudding into the side of the boat and they tear great chunks of it all the way back home. The sharks show no mercy to the dead fish or to the fisherman. And when he arrives finally back in his port, he has a skeleton of the biggest marlin that was ever caught. And for Hemingway, that is a picture of the futility of human life. He was a man, a sensuous man, an immoral man. And at the end of his life, he was in despair. He was in darkness. And he wrote this book to speak to people about facing up the futility of life. He blew his brains out a year later. People do find life futile, don't they? You work till you retire and the week after you get a heart attack. You live for your children and then the children one day tell you they're emigrating to New Zealand. You open a business and laws change and now what you're selling isn't in demand. You open a shop and the pandemic closes it. And you might expect Jesus to go to Peter this night as he's worn out and weary and uh, say, uh, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. You consider how Jesus ordered this miracle. How he said to Peter, go out it now into the deep. Go away from the shore and let down your nets. It's not a suggestion. Who are you dealing with? This is a commandment from the incarnate God. The God who says that we should meet together and worship together and pray and sing his praise and preach his word and hear his word. We're not here because uh, we like a little bit of religion. We're here because we are people under the authority of the creator of the universe who has become our saviour, Jesus Christ. Put down, put out to the deep and let down your nets, he says. And Peter protests. Peter says, <laughs> we've been fishing all night and we've caught nothing. And Peter's exhausted. Uh, he longs to get home and clamber into bed and snore. And he's got nothing to show for all his labors. And he gives Jesus a chance to show some compassion and change his mind. Peter says to him, uh, but at your word, verse 5, but at your word. How, how important is that? Well, men and women, it's, it's all important. If you decide you're going to obey Jesus when it fits in with your plans and your ideas, then uh, you consider him not to be your Lord and your God at all. If you can pick and choose then he's no longer the word made flesh. He's no longer I and my father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen God. And there'll be no catch. And there'll be empty nets and empty pews. The spirit of Jesus Christ will be quenched. There'll be no life of Christ because his spirit has been grieved. There's no place for um, a tentative, occasional nod at Jesus. Love so amazing, so divine, demands our souls, our lives, our all. Listen to Peter. But at your word, I will let down the nets. Now, the result of 
Peter's obedience was that there was a great number of fish. You understand the contrast between these two men. Um, Peter was a fisherman. Peter was the local man. Peter knew where to go and what time of the day or the night to go out fishing. Peter knew this. His father was a fisherman before him. All he wanted to do since he was a little boy was go with daddy on the boat and catch fish. Jesus was a landlubber. Jesus' father was a carpenter in landlocked Nazareth. Peter knew all about fishing. What time, where to go. Uh, let Jesus stick to inspirational messages. That is what he was great at. Let him tell his wonderful parables. That's what Jesus could do. But Peter, he was the fisherman. He was the top. But he did what Jesus told him to do. It's always wise. It's always absolutely essential. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And going out then and casting his nets in, he, he suddenly started to feel the ropes going and uh, a turmoil in the water as fish seemed to come from every direction. And they filled the nets. Uh, the, the nets began to break with the strain. And he called across to, uh, to James and John. And he said, come, come quickly, please come and help us. How our nets are breaking. He pulled the net in and it filled his boat up to the gunnels. And then the men pulled on the net also. And it filled their boat. And the boats began to sink with the weight of the fish that was there. Now you consider the Lord of this miracle, um, that this isn't just a nice story, but this actually happened one day where a degree of latitude crosses a degree of longitude on this planet. Jesus told men to go out to a certain place and fish, and the result was a draft of fishes that they'd never seen in their lives before. Who is this person? Well, he is the omnipotent God, made flesh, the almighty one who's taken and added to himself then a human nature. Um, and what has he done? Well, he's commanded all the fish in Galilee to come and he's the great magnet focused on that net and they've all come thousands and thousands of fish have come everyone obeys him we say O oh Lord our Lord how excellent is thy name in, in all the earth and we talk about what he's done and we say uh, all sheep and oxen all the fish of the sea all that passes through the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, in the sea, under the sea. This is what the Lord Jesus does. Um, when he speaks, the wind obeys him. When he speaks, a tree withers and dies. When he speaks, great pots of water are turned into great pots of wine he can walk on water he can enable other men to walk on water the depth of the sea psalm 95 <clears throat> they are in his hand psalm 148 praise the lord from the earth you great sea creatures who is in control who's in control of the virus who's in control of the winds of the climate, of the rain, of the sun shining, of the four seasons, of the fish, of the sea, of the atom. They all shall sweetly obey his will. In First Kings chapter 4 we are told about King Solomon. 
Just what a remarkable intellect. He could answer all the questions that were fired at him. People lined up early in the morning to have an audience with him. And he spoke and answered all their questions. And we are told he knew all about fish. First Kings 4. Now here is one greater than Solomon. Because he controls the fish of the sea. The depths of the oceans. All creatures live and move and have their being in him. Like me. And like all of you. He decreed that we should be alive and breathing and we should be brought here today to listen to his word and our brains should record what we're hearing and we should think very seriously about what happened by Blue Gallery those years ago. He's determined that you should come and that I should give you this message The Lord Omnipotent, that's who it is. Or we can answer it in another way and we can say that the Lord who does this miracle is the Messianic King. He's the one who led the, <clears throat> the children of Israel into the desert and led them through Moses and gave Moses an earnest spirit of intercession for the people when the burden of leadership was so heavy upon him as it is on all preachers and elders and deacons in our churches in these days. And Moses says in that prayer, he says, Why are you troubling me, Lord? What have I done? Did I conceive these people? Did I give birth to them and yet you were telling me to carry them like a nurse carries a baby in her arms? I can't do it. These people, they are too heavy for me. You know they are saying, give us meat. How can I give them meat? Do you know what they are saying? Oh, for the fish of Egypt. They are looking back to eating fish, to the freshwater fish of the Nile and the saltwater fish of the Med. And oh, we love the no fish uh, in the desert. They're saying, manna Monday, manna Tuesday, manna Wednesday, manna every day. And Moses turns to the Lord and he says to him, Would they have enough if all the fish of the sea were caught for them? And Moses questions whether God is up to taking a million people from Egypt and through the wilderness into the promised land. Can God provide the needs of this congregation, the needs of your family, the needs of you, of the gospel Christians in Britain today? Moses feels I'm carrying the can and it's all too heavy for me. The buck is stopping with me too much of the time. And uh, the Lord is saying to him, you think that the Lord's arm is too short, that it can't reach down to Belvedere, uh, that it can't reach down to Free Grace Church that it can't reach down to your family or to your individual life. It's, your problems are so immense, your challenge is so great that he can't save you. And God says, you'll see if I can provide. Look at me, trust in my power. Luke chapter 5, this miracle, answers the tension in the book of Numbers. When Moses is confronted with a grumbling, complaining people. So here Jesus has prayed. And his prayer is for wisdom now. And enabling to the people, the men that he will choose to write the Gospels. And preach at Pentecost. And send the word of God across the Middle East. And so... 
he calls the fish of the sea to fill the nets of Peter. And he shows he is the Lord of creation and he is the messianic king that's been promised. So what's your response? Uh, what do you think of Luke 5? The, well, did it happen? Well, the, the alternative is that it was a, a fairy story. That, that we've gathered round this book and we've read and you've heard and I'm preaching on a fairy story. My friends, there are many more realities that we have to address than fairy stories, aren't there? You're saying that this book is written by liars? This book is written by hypocrites? By servants of Jesus who were told by him, don't you bear false witness? And that's what exactly what they've done, they've borne false witness. They're charlatans, they're frauds. That this was a big conspiracy, they all got together. And they lied about him conquering death. They lied that they had seen him. You know, they died. They, some of them were crucified. Others were killed with a sword. And, and they did this for a lie they had invented. Psychologically, men and women, that is utterly impossible. They laid their lives down, not for a political theory or for revolution, but for just one fact. The third day he rose again from the dead. He was seen by Peter and the Twelve, and he was seen by Mary and the woman. He was seen by two on the road to Emmaus. He was seen by 500 men. And they loved to talk about it. Like that friend of yours who was invited because of her good works to go to Buckingham Palace and uh, have a garden party with the Queen. At three o'clock, the national anthem sounded and the doors opened and she and Prince Philip came out and, uh, and she moved and she talked so naturally and welcomed people and talked to them. And she talked to me, your friend says, you know what? She asked me what I was doing and how was the work. And You believe your friend, don't you? You do, don't you? She's, she's not telling you the way she tells it. You know it, it happened. And here is Luke. And the accuracy of the details that he gives and the little personal touches that appear. And this person I know a conjurer can do amazing things he can walk across the Thames so he walked down the side of a building and, but when he speaks he's got a little voice and he has no message he has no authority he has no wisdom and truth and authority and he can't save the way the people surrounding you here that you know week by week and have watched for many years have a certain fragrance, a certain moral stature, a certain love and patience and kindness that is saying to you, whatever it is, I wish I could live like them. It's Jesus who's done this. The Jesus who caused these fish to fill the nets of Peter. The Jesus who when men drove nails through his hands and feet and lifted him up in agony on a cross to hang there for hours, he didn't say, you wait till my father gets you. But he said, Father, forgive them. Imagine, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What was Peter's response? How, how did Peter react?
to <laughs> these bursting nets. There's fish filling the boats. So, oh, what, what, what was Peter's reaction to you say? Boy, the fishing business has never been so good since I've got Jesus as my partner. Did he say that? I make a killing in the market this day. No one else got anything last night. And now I'm going to go with all these fish. I've got to get another boat. I've got to get more men to work for me. I'm way ahead of competition. I'm going to be wealthy with Jesus in my boat. He didn't say that, did he? Not at all. Many are saying it, many are saying it standing in a pulpit with an open Bible in front of them and they're preaching a prosperity gospel that if you trust in Jesus you'll get a Rolls Royce and a big house with a drive and you won't know what to do with all your money if you trust in Jesus. It wasn't Peter's reaction at all, was it? You know, his famous reaction recorded here. What did Peter do with these boats full of fish? He fell down amongst them, amongst their tossing, quivering, jumping attempts to get back in the sea, and he fell amongst them. He collapsed. He's utterly overwhelmed. Go away, he says. Go away from me. Go away. Leave me. Leave me. You don't know who I am. I, I've hidden who I really am from you. I, I'm, I'm a sinful man. If you knew who I was, you wouldn't want me to be one of your followers, one of your disciples. I'd let you down. I'll pollute you. Commentators are perplexed at that reaction because there's been no great moral action. Um, he hasn't delivered people from demon possession. He hasn't uh, healed the blind or give, uh, uh, give cleansing to a leper. There's just a lot of fish. That's all. Why this response? Why was Peter on on his knees well you, you know the answer of course fishing was his business fishing was what he knew better than anything else in the world and when Peter saw this boat filled with fish James and John's boat filled with fish he knew the messianic Lord had come one whose name would be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He was in the boat with him. He was there. It was Jesus, the Promised One. The God who had spoken in past by the prophets had in these last days. He'd been preaching there on the beach. And he prayed. He said, Ah, Oh, Lord, I, I feel so dirty in your presence. You wouldn't want me. You wouldn't want me in your church. You wouldn't want me a member of your church. I'd, I'd, let, it, I'd let them down. You wouldn't want me as a, a, a pastor, as an elder, as a deacon. Go away. You find it, don't you, Adam? When he's sinned, he, he wants to hide from the Lord get behind the bushes when uh, Abram is there at the great trees of Mamre and these three divine figures come he falls at his feet Job says I despise myself Isaiah says woe is me I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips Ezekiel when he saw the great sign of God's presence he fell face downwards when John on Patmos say, sees the same Jesus that Peter was seeing here then he fell down before him 
God is light and uh, our hearts are dark our minds, our imaginations are dirty how does Jesus prepare someone to be a fisher of men he does so by giving that man a clearer view of the great glory of Jesus Christ that's the only way that we see him and our jaws drop we say ah oh, he said this he did this he is this and this is my Lord and my Savior and we're overwhelmed by the near loving beauty and grace of Jesus Christ. There's no other way that we are prepared to be fishers of men by that. And then you see what he says. He says, don't be afraid. You don't know what life is all about. You don't know what it will cost you. You don't know if you can continue as, as a Christian. If you are you're stirred again at the thought that this Jesus could be your Lord and God and Savior. And you think, I, I couldn't keep it up. I, I'd, I'd fall away. Don't be afraid. It's fear. It's carnal fear makes you makes you say that don't be afraid children don't be afraid young people unbelievers don't be afraid for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world lust of the flesh lust of the eyes pride of life but that the world through him might be saved he did not he did not come to judge the world he did not come here this morning to meet with you, to judge you and condemn you. He did not come to judge the world. He did not come to blame. He did not only come to seek, it was to save. He came here today and you are here. And when we call him Jesus, we call him by his name. Don't be afraid. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. They, they're the happy ones. They're the happy ones. Two men went into the temple to pray. And one man kissed, beat his breast, looked down. God be merciful to me, a sinner. That's all he could say. Yeah. Jesus didn't come here today because this would be where the righteous would gather. And he's only interested in righteous people. Jesus came to call sinners, come, come now, you come. If you tarry till you're better, you'll never come. You might never be nearer to Jesus than you are today, this great Jesus. He's here to be your Lord, to be your Savior. A man once came from Galilee no man as great as he they left their work and went with him his followers to be Lord Jesus be our teacher now and may we learn from you to love and serve the living God and other people too People say, I wonder what happened to all those fish. Were they sold and the money from the sale went to support Peter and Andrew and James and John as they gave up the fishing business to follow him? Well, you see, the Lord who calls you is the Lord who provides just for you in the frailty and the meekness of your own life what is evangelism evangelism is catching men in the power of the kingdom what are your expectations for the future of this congregation 
or the Church of Jesus Christ in, in, in Britain today. Remember how uh, Jesus made good this sign. Remember how on the day of Pentecost, Peter threw out his net and how he caught 3,000 men in that net, a full net. Paul went to Corinth, one man, and there were 10,000 people in that congregation. Martin Luther went to Germany and transformed the country. Spurgeon went to the Elephant and Castle and changed it. John Patton went to the New Hebrides. When he went, he didn't know any Christians there at all. And when he finished his ministry, there didn't seem to be anyone who wasn't a Christian. Think of the day a net caught you and drew you to Jesus. What encouragement us to go where he says go to do what he says and to expect growth and fullness and a weight of blessing you don't measure of course we don't measure the grace of God by statistics we men measure it by the power of the kingdom and the attractiveness here's the command fish for men the precept fish for men the promise I will make you fishers of men the prayer make me a fisher of men Lord bless your word to us we pray bring much good or oh, may we see a catch of living men that we haven't seen before. May there be great and blessed and glorious days for the Church of Jesus.